What's going on, guys? Raymond, the intern here today. Lee's nowhere to be found. I'm in charge. I'm at the helm. I'm going to answer the questions that you ask me on YouTube, Facebook, email, um, whatever. And I love the first one from George here. Um, George is asking me if I'm concerned about the Nikon announcements this week regarding the DL line, some restructuring and stuff. And, you know, I am actually concerned. The the DL line, just to steal a line from Lee that was uh, somewhat misappropriated <laughs> about the D500, the DL line does look like it was too little too late, and it looks like that Nikon recognized that, and I'm actually glad about that aspect of it. Um, companies like Nikon, no matter how big or small, shouldn't be afraid to fail, and if they saw that the DL was a failure, fail fast, don't hit market, don't have to talk one quarter, two quarters from now um, how poorly it went, just get rid of it, and do something better. <laughs> um, what I'm concerned about is the do something better part, and I'm concerned about their marketing. And something you may remember, you may not, when the Nikon DF was first introduced, they, uh, they had a clever campaign. They had a guy walking around like in Narnia or something with the DF camera, and it was like the essence or pure photography or something like that, who cares? I like those commercials because they were, they were a good, um, concept, but what I didn't like was they were just clearly lined up for a particular product release. I need Nikon. I don't care. It doesn't matter what I need. I think that they need to do more selling the concept of photography, and if you've sold me on photography, I'm probably going to buy your cameras. If you're just trying to sell me a new camera every time you decide you need to bring one to market to have a good quarter, to have a good year, I'm less excited about it because then the, 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 the mystery, the veil of sales is, is gone and you're clear, clearly just trying to t sell me something. I don't see the kind of passion in their advertising that I see, that I see only occasionally in these individual campaigns like the one for the DF reinforced to me over and over again how much fun photography can be and how I can share these memories, sell me the idea of capturing these memories and these events instead of just trying to sell me a camera every time it comes out. I think, one, the, the marketing on the DL, the pre-marketing was non-existent as, as far as I could tell. I didn't go out looking for it. Um, and I certainly uh, look at plenty of photography-related stuff. Uh, so not bringing it to market is probably the best decision, and I'm like I said, I'm proud of them for that. I'm impressed that they didn't bring it to market. But on the other hand, do something like what Canon's doing with their mirrorless and what Fuji's done, where they've built you know an entire great system around something besides the conventional DSLR. Uh, that Nikon's been doing a good job of um, evolving but really hasn't done anything revolutionary, at least not in at least a few years. So um, I'm pretty impassioned about, about that. Like I said, I'm glad, but I'm concerned. Uh, Kevin wants to know what superpower I would want and how it would benefit your my photography. Um, I want to be the human drone where I, there's got to be restrictions on it. I just can't be flying around all the time, but for like 45 seconds at a time, I can hover like up to 100 feet in the air and have limited like horizontal mobility and then I have to go back down. So when I need to get a cool shot, I can be like So that would be my superpower, would be the human drone photographer, human drone camera. Uh, David um, wants to know if he's, I didn't quite understand the question, but um, protect, but I'll answer it anyway. Protected by email in uh, metadata and no watermark, uh, assuming presumably you're posting pictures online or sharing them with someone who might share them on social media, you're not protected at all. If you send someone your pictures or you post them somewhere, people can steal them, appropriate them, reappropriate them, misappropriate them, and it's just something that we've all got to deal with in this age where photographs get shared on other screens around the world through electronic means. Um, if it is a big company that makes a lot of money, register the copyright and try to sue the shit out of them. Uh, Tori Ling wants to know if he can get a book. Tori, you can get a book. you got to check it out on Patreon, though, or on snapchick.com. What is it? Take Me Home? I forget what the top of the website says. Candy or chocolate for Valentine's Day? Tori, both. 
you've got to have an equal mix of the candy and of the chocolate and you shove them in your face. Do you Netflix and chill? What is your favorite Netflix original? Tori, I'm not even cool enough to understand what, what that even means. I don't even have Netflix anymore. I did have Netflix. I don't have it anymore. Um, Shin wants to know, what is your favorite Snapchat photograph and why? And I do have a favorite. Now, there's two kinds of Snapchat photographs. There's ones that she's taken herself. I'm excluding those. I'm going to stick in my answer to the other kind, which is ones that I've taken. And there is one in particular, I'm going to put it up on the screen right now, where it's nothing, not, not an exotic location, we're actually about 10 feet to my right uh, when that picture was taken. And I just think it all worked together. I think the way that she was done up worked very well, hair, makeup, all that good stuff. The background is just kind of airy. It's to me, um, it's what I like to do in a portrait because it's, there's not a location there, but it's not just a studio backdrop either. She's somewhere there's something going on but you're not distracted by anything in the background it's tough for me to answer why it just i feel like that portrait worked and that's just the kind of thing where i look and i can't describe it much differently than some portraits that didn't work but for me that's what it's about is looking at a picture and saying that it all fits together there i can't even explain why but use it go with it um i'm gonna mess up this name goodmunder wants to know what is my favorite camera and lens. Now, some of you might realize that changes by the day <laughs> here in the, in the studio with all this stuff um, that we do have. But I tell you what, the D500 as a camera body is uh, darn cool. We got it here because I think we kind of felt like we had to since it was so long after the D300S. We made like the soap opera video about it. We did the face-to-face -face video about it where we really... Uh, talked about it, and I almost kind of forgot <laughs> during that buildup that we were going to be picking up the camera and using it. So it was kind of, like, this is almost embarrassing to say, but actually using it out in the field and me using it was kind of an afterthought. Like, the whole point was to kind of get Lee's impressions of it, have her use it as a primary camera alongside her, her D810, and, and for me, you know, kind of call it a day. And, you know, what's funny, what I think about when I think about the D500 is in the movie, uh, The Force Awakens. Sorry, I have to check all the stuff here. I'm not used to being on camera. Like, am I recording? Do I have enough time? Sorry. Um, distraction. The movie, The Force Awakens, when Han Solo takes Chewbacca's crossbow gun thing and he goes, oh, I like this. You know, can, can I use that? And that's kind of what happened with the D500 is I took a couple shots of it, maybe handed it back, and then it was time to take, for me to take some more pictures. And I was like, hey, uh, can I use that D500 over there? So it was a very natural thing for me to start using it. I never decided that I was just gonna grab the D500 anytime that I could, but it's just something that I started doing. As for lenses, it, that's tougher. I love that 17 to 55 f2.8 that we got back here. Um, somewhere uh, for it that's, you know, f2.8 throughout the range, you know, you've got a good zoom that really acts like a prime in a lot of respects. Um, but there's nothing wrong with taking that D500, putting a 35 millimeter prime on it. Um, surprisingly fun with our 24 millimeter old school, I think it's an AFD lens that we've got back there, 24 millimeter f2.8. Um, that gives you a good wider, um, wider than normal uh, field of view on the D500. So um, favorite camera right now, D500, favorite lens, anything that fits on the D500, which is a lot of lenses. Um, Hernan said, I want to see this when we said that I'd be doing a Q&A. Well, here it is. Isn't it great? I'm so disoriented right now. There's, I'm not used to being in the bright lights. I have no idea what's going on. Lee just set everything up for me and left. See, look, I'm totally like, can't even figure out where I am right now. Oh, there's one question left, but it's a big one. Lucas wins today because Lucas, there's no prize, but Lucas has uh, really the question that I was wanted, maybe the question that I would have answered um, anyway, but Lucas and I were like joined at the brain here. Uh, Lucas really wants to know what it's like. Here I am looking at that stuff again. Lucas wants to know what it's like working as Snapchick's intern. What projects do I want to do? What, what would I change, improve, extend? Any secrets, any behind the scenes stuff that nobody knows about? Um, so yeah, let's take it top down here. 
Um, what's it like working as the intern? It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's very busy. There's a lot of things that I do that you'll never see, talking to vendors, trying to you know, see how we can incorporate different brands, different techniques, not to make a whole lot of money, but to um, get the stuff in front of you that you've said that you want to see. Some of it has to come in from the vendors because some of it, like we've got a few action cams back there now, we reviewed the gimbal and whatever, and it's great when they can send it and we can show it off. And um, I know sometimes people say like, oh, this is an advertisement. Well, guess what? When vendors send something and we don't like it, we'll send it back. Even if they say don't send it back, I'm like putting it in a box, wrapping it up in tape and, and literally sending it back to them. We're not gonna put something on screen here and bring attention to something that just doesn't work. And if something's really broken, we'll bring attention to it, but not in a good way. <laughs> so um, yes, the, the things that you tend to see on this channel from a product standpoint, are things sometimes that were sent at no cost, but the we got to like it before we put it on the air. And if we don't like it, we don't um, we don't put it on the air. Most of what we talk about that and the stuff that's back here, the D five hundred, all that stuff, we bought just like everybody else. the The perceived glamour of getting a bunch of stuff in and just having it, everything that we want. Hey, there's some channels with hundreds of millions or billions of viewers that are like that. We're a little bit different. And there's, and, and I'll talk a little more about what we kind of don't go after either. Um, what projects do you want to do personally? I like the longer form stuff. I'm its own worst enemy because I am kind of behind the scenes, always kind of driving to what content we're going to get up on a given week. And I'm always talking about how much content we're going to get up in a given week. And then we'll take a road trip somewhere and talk the whole time about some longer format video that we want to do, maybe something that's an hour or even longer. And then we don't do it because we're busy getting like, you know, as many videos as we can in a week to keep everybody watching, keep everybody seeing the things that you want to see when we put stuff out. It wouldn't be, it w I don't think it would go over well. I don't think it would go poorly if we said, hey, we're going to take a month where we're just going to post some old stuff because we're making a cool long video. If that's something you want to see, let me know and we'll get behind it. It's just tough to think that way. Now, when I, when I think of a long video, I think of maybe a multi-stop trip around the country or something where we're skydiving one minute with, with a certain setup. And then we go to a different park or somewhere like that. And we're bringing out a different set of gear using some of the same gear, really telling a story about how you can pack up and go and use all this little stuff. Now drones, now that she's got the Mavic, and really use all that stuff together in different environments. I think that would be great. I think that would be quite an epic to have a one to two hour video that was the whole stream of how you can use this stuff and how this could be done. Um, to that point, the footnote on that is really improving the vendor perceptions of that. A lot of, we get a lot of unsolicited emails every day from somebody who's got a new gadget, and some of the stuff is really cool, but they want a three to five minute video that just says how great it is. And nine times out of 10, unless it's something really cool that we wanted to get our hands on and show off, nine times out of 10, we completely ignore those emails. I put them in a file of people that I'll get back to someday um, because they don't, I've tried, uh, and some do, but, some, but the most don't understand that if you wanna be part of an epic, that would be great for us and it would be great for them, but they want that three to five minute review. And if we did all those, this channel would just be three to five minute reviews of sometimes questionable gadgets. That would be its fun own channel, but that's not what we're trying to do here. Um, to that end, you do see some other channels that have a lot more viewers. In fact, there's one this week that's trying to make a lot of noise about what's going on with Nikon on the inside, blah, 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 maybe some flashy headlines. Uh, we don't try to do that. We try to be more reasonable than that, maybe a little bit more objective, maybe a little less, dare I say, like clickbait-y. Um, when it comes to that, and just have candid conversations like I'm trying to do now um, about that uh, stuff. So I think ultimately that costs us some subscribers and viewers because it seems to be what a lot of people are chasing because maybe they, you know, see that that equals money with the advertising and stuff. But, you know, and Lee and I have talked a lot about that, but we both have come to the same conclusion is we wouldn't really be as excited about getting up and working on this if we were just trying to get the latest viewer counts on some like headline of controversy and then kind of a, a weaker video around that. And then uh, let's see, to wrap up here, I've been rambling for way too long. 
Um, I talked about intertwining videos, getting two or three themes together into one of those epics. So I, I hit that plenty. Um, surprises, things, secrets. Some videos are literally conceived. It's kind of bonkers behind the scenes sometimes, especially when we both have too much coffee and we get talking. Uh, some videos are literally conceived like a few seconds before airtime. In other words, like we've got the setup right now and we'll debrief after this video and another topic might come up and immediate, immediately we're filming again with something that we didn't write notes on, that we didn't talk about, et cetera. And by the other side of the coin, some videos that you see that might look like a throwaway, you know, a Thursday morning quick video may have been conceived over the course of months and finally crafted. And then it comes off as something that, you know, we just made spontaneously. And sometimes it's almost disappointing to see uh, the work that we put into something, and then it's just kind of like, okay, that, that was cool, but I guess it didn't really come together, really ultimately wasn't as exciting as, as we thought it uh, would be. Um, one other thing that people might not realize is uh, people email, communicate with Lee in a lot of di different ways, uh, surprising amount of email every day. It's, it's, it's tough to look at the screen. I freak out when I see the inbox. Um, she really does try to get back to everybody. Um, she'll chase an answer down with vendors if it's a very specific question about maybe a particular product, maybe something that e hasn't even hit the market yet. I've seen her work the phones for two days to get a one-sentence answer about something that maybe didn't even seem very important to me, but a viewer wanted to know, and she tracked it down. And uh, more power to her for having that kind of loyalty. Sometimes she's got me working the phones to get some of those answers as well, uh, just to get the information, uh, just to work things um, in parallel. People might not realize that. It's not just about like turning the camera on and trying to get viewers and everything like that. Um, she genuinely is working every day to you know, help the individuals. Of course, there's the members and now the patrons who get that much more of that kind of follow through. Um, so that's really amazing to see. And I think it would surprise a lot of people as to um, how much follow through and how much of her time when she could be making videos, she spends interacting one on one. Those of you who have emailed with her, you probably appreciate that. Those who haven't, you probably have no idea that that really does go on behind uh, the scenes. Any other secrets or surprises? It's really tough because um, what I see, I see both sides. I see when the camera's not rolling and I see when the cameras are rolling. And I very much would Lee see the same person the same thinking, the same thought process. So much of the conversations that we've had or you know, when she's just come in and had a one-way conversation to bounce an idea off me, five minutes later the camera's on and she's saying exactly the same thing and maybe even developing the idea further. Um, so what you see here isn't contrived. This isn't like an area that is just used for production. Obviously, you know, this is the area that uh, she gets work done as well. It's kind of funny um, how I'll see I'll remember a video that didn't exist because I just see her working and converse with her and stuff like that. And it wasn't really a video, but it's the whole setup. So in my mind, like, surely there was a video on that. I, I saw you do it. No, we were just having a conversation. Um, so it is very genuine. Um, I wouldn't ever imagine it being uh, any other way. Uh, she's been at this for seven years now. Um, I've been along for uh, most of that. And I, I, don't, I don't think the temptation's there to sometimes, you know, get those views, get those, you know, cheap cheap wins, but it's just not her style. It's not my style. So, you know, to me, that's why it works. So anyway, guys, I rambled long enough. Thanks for hanging on with me this week for Raymond Week. And uh, she'll be back in the desk, I promise. I think we're going to do something a little back and forth on uh, Friday or later this week. So you'll see that too. Take care, guys. Keep those questions coming in.